August season in the church calendar between Pentecost and then Advent when we start all over again. And so our forebears in the faith called this longest season in the church year ordinary time, which seems fitting because I think most of our lives are ordinary time, and sometimes you wish there was more excitement. But as I said to someone, if you, if you think you wish you had excitement all the time, think about coming back from a long trip or recovering from an illness. All that we want is ordinary time. We want routine. You want to be able to do a load of wash. You want to be able to mow the lawn and have energy for that and get back into routine. So this Sunday marks the end of the church calendar and what is called ordinary time. Pope Pius XI, in 1925, established this day as Christ the King Sunday, which is often now known as Reign of Christ Sunday. So the church calendar is set up so we can walk with Jesus from Advent, which is anticipating his birth, to Christmas, which is the birth, and, and all the way through the seasons. And this last Sunday, then, we pause and are invited to affirm that Christ is sovereign over us in our lives. And I think it's hard for us to think about sovereignty. Who is sovereign over us? We don't, we don't have that, that notion, certainly not in our government. I think we're all we're curious many times about what's going on with the royals over in, in uh, Great Britain. We look in on their lives with some curiosity, but we've never wanted a king here or a queen. Um, we barely treat our own presidents with respect these days, I'm afraid to say. And so, how do we understand sovereignty, someone who is over us, a, a merciful but powerful Lord who rules over us? How do we understand that? I don't know that we, if we spent 20 minutes here, if we'd be able to come up with one ruler that we would say, this person is a person of God, who is holy, who is righteous, this person is um, uses their power well is universally accepted i don't know that we find someone that we all agreed on because it's hard to find folks like that and we don't have the same opinions of what that looks like so in this lectionary passage from god john's gospel we encounter jesus in one of the very last conversations that he has in his earthly life and he stands before almighty Pilate, who has life and death power over him and yet, Jesus is the one who challenges Pilate. He, he challenges Pilate to accept his word as truth. Jesus says to this ruler, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And of course, Pilate isn't having it. He replies with, in my mind, I hear a sneer. Truth, huh? What is that? Almost like he spits out the words at Jesus. What is truth? Jesus' model of leadership doesn't make sense to Pilate. It certainly doesn't mimic his style of leadership, which is power over people. And so he outright rejects Jesus, the king of the Jews who has been brought before him. So while Pilate has to decide, what am I going to do with this kind of ordinary guy that's been brought before me? It's Jesus who controls the conversation. So Pilate doesn't have to tolerate wisecracks, but Jesus says, well, so you say, are you the king? You, you're the one who said it. But, but Pilate, for that kind of insubordinate response, could have immediately had him sent off and, and killed. But Pilate seems sort of curious about who this Jesus is. He's trying to dig at the truth of what is true about him. I think he looks at Jesus and thinks, this guy doesn't look like a threat to the Roman Empire. So, so what is it about this guy that has drawn so many followers? So while Pilate is pondering his plight, Jesus quietly holds court. Knowing that huge crowds have followed this man, Pilate realizes he's trapped. I mean, does he dare choose his own verdict about Jesus and live that out? This man who was dragged before him in the middle of the night? Or does he have to worry about what happens if I make a decision about him that the majority of people are not in favor of? What does that mean? Is Governor Pilate trapped? 
And I wonder if we are. I wonder if there are times that we compromise our direction so that we can go where we want or so that we can stay where we're at. I wonder if sometimes our ethics can be compromised because of pressures around us. So on this last Sunday in the church calendar year, we're invited to acknowledge who is sovereign over our lives. I wonder how often we really think about that. What, what is really foundational to my life? What really is the undergirding principle that I respond to? It, it's very easy for us to follow the tide of public opinion and to be caught up in what others are saying and just the way that our culture uh, dictates what we do. It's hard to fight that actually. And so right now we're trying to pin blame on someone for COVID causality. Who's behind this? How did this come about? We take our cues on social issues from posturing politicians and we rant about vacillating vaccine um, policies. And we see that mask mandates literally have led to murderous mayhem at times. We're anxiously checking the stock market hoping we can provide for ourselves until the end of our days and at the same time stockpiling TP to make it through another winter. We're planning trips, we're going out for treats, we're sending texts, we're responding to tweets, we're happy when we get LOLs and feel popular when we get likes, we're aching for advanced degrees and we're also seeking animated conversationalists for the times that we get together for dinner gatherings. So who has time to figure out what or who is sovereign over us in our lives. The path of least resistance for us, which would be totally supported by our culture, is by deciding that we are the greatest concern in our own lives, that we just have to take care of number one. No one would question it if that were what we chose. And so we do things to please ourselves. I think, I think one pastor who said that he had a parishioner who was at one moment, at one time in her life, seeking out the counsel of 12 professional counselors who addressed different areas in her life to try to figure out what was right for her. She was lost. She didn't know where she belonged. And so rather than looking at herself or turning to her God, she was asking 12 gurus to help her figure out who she was, and when that wasn't working, she didn't know where else to turn. She obsessed over herself. And I think of a quote by Craig Barnes in the book that we've been reading, Searching for Home, where he says, all week long, contemporary society saturates us with self. We've been taught to worry about my needs, my children, my money problems, my lack of Fulfillment. Monday through Saturday is all about me. So by the time I arrive at worship on Sunday morning, I am sick and tired of me. Without God as our guide, without faith, without something greater than ourselves, we will find that we are trapped, even if the selfies look really good. So the question at the heart of this conversation between Pilate and Jesus is really one of belonging. Where do I belong? Who are my people? Whose am I? And we struggle with this as adults. I met a woman who said that in the decades since she was divorced, she has moved 10 times, trying to figure out where she belongs, trying to find home, and not being able to successfully do that because she doesn't understand who she is any longer for a decade trying to understand that so as adults we can leave relationships if we will we can have one night stands if we will we can test our sense of belonging in families in churches some have tested their sense of belonging in our nation where do i belong who are my people and, and some test their quality of their relationships by drifting away and seeing if anyone notices. And as we grow weary on our journey, we discover that we will not be find the place where we belong until we finally understand that it isn't just about who we are, but rather that it has to do with a gathering of people who meet for purposes greater than themselves. 
It's not until we fully understand that truth comes from a holy place, from someone who is much greater than we. So what Jesus is saying in this conversation with one of the most powerful men of his era is that belonging is not so much about a personal decision. It's more about being an active member of a, of a group of people, a community who gets together to think beyond themselves to understand that there are needs that come as groups. And so in this trial, Pilate assumes that he is the most powerful man around. He has power over Jesus' life. He has power to dictate that Jesus will die. And he even brags to Jesus about his power. But the truth is, Pilate is trapped. He knows it, but he's trying not to let on that he knows it. The Jewish leaders have brought Jesus before Pilate because they want him killed. And the Jews are a heady, exasperating mix of a population that is substantial in Jerusalem. And so what happens to Pilate if he doesn't give them what they want? What happens to Pilate if he isn't able to control the population and keep the city calm? A central tenet of the job description. And so as he interacts with Jesus and he's forming his own opinion about who this Jesus is, he wonders if he has enough troops on hand to put down an uprising if he decides to let Jesus go, because he knows that there will be violence. So Pilate hides his true convictions and his haunting fears. I wonder what fears we have. We all have fears at some point or another. I wonder what truth scares the living daylights out of us. I wonder what ruminations come in the night that makes sleep hard to come by. I wonder if we churchgoers are afraid while we're slogging through this prolonged season of COVID that continues to ask us to do things that we would rather not do. So on the reign of Christ Sunday, we're invited to consider who it is that we worship. Before whom do we bow and claim as sovereign over us? Are we worried as a congregation about losing members? Are we worried that we're losing our position in our community because we keep our distance from one another in safe ways? Even as his life hangs in the balance, Jesus offers to Pilate this opportunity to know him, to know truth, to know what matters. Jesus tries to meet the real Pilate in this moment, which is really remarkable. The man who has power over his life, and Jesus is authentically reaching out to him. Pilate is trapped in his efforts to legislate what needs to happen with this man. And so in the very last conversation before he dies, Jesus offers Pilate the deal of a life. And he says, everyone who belongs to truth listens to my voice. And even who ultimately releases him to be killed, Jesus introduces himself as the good shepherd, willing to serve him and love him. Jesus is showing love to his enemy in that last moment. And so today, we take a moment to pause before we start with Advent next week to examine who is foundational to our lives, and whom shall we worship? Craig Barnes talks about the immobilizing impact of having so many choices and not knowing what is right. We anguish over which wallpaper to choose for a room that we're redecorating. We anguish over which college to go to. We're worried on some shows about which of the 24 bachelors we start out with that we're going to marry. And we have to sift through all of them and look at their attributes. What if we get it wrong? Is God going to be with us if we choose the wrong path, if the wrong fork in the road is taken? Will God give up on us along the way if we choose a direction that doesn't seem to be right? And so our angst about the myriad choices that are facing us on a daily basis can be enough to just shut us down and to make us retreat and to decide not to do anything. 
So Barnes suggests a different vantage point for those of us who are baptized into the Christian faith and who hang on to that belief that we are followers of Jesus. He writes, so instead of worrying about finding the right road, we ought to be focused on the right river, the one that creates new life. You don't travel a river like you do a road. You travel in it. Because the river is not passive like a road. It does all the work of carrying you to a new place, the right place, the place in the triune family. Maybe some of you have heard of Tyndale Publishing. It came about in the 1960s, but it harkens back to William Tyndale, who was a translator of the Bible into English in the time of the Reformation. He's an English man, an English scholar, and during the Re Reformation, there was this flourishing time of scholarship, which made the Greek texts of the Bible available for people to look at for the first time. And so Tyndale wanted to translate the Bible in the 1500s into an English uh, copy that people could understand, and he wanted to go back to the Hebrew and Greek texts to get the best possible translation. And we have these Bibles in our pews, and we maybe take those for granted, but it's important that we recognize that Tyndale was not lauded for the hard work that he was doing, for the, the rigorous scholarship that he was following. He was a Protestant reformer, and so he was targeted both by the Catholic Church and also by the British government that controlled all ecclesial matters. And they determined that he was stepping beyond his rank and out of bounds by doing this scholarship. And he was arrested in 1535. He was held in a castle until he could be tried for heresy for the work that he was doing to translate the Bible into usable English for a people who were hungry to have access to it. And as a translator of the scriptures of holy works, Tyndale acknowledged that there was a much higher authority over him than the King of England or the Roman Catholic Church. And so a year later, he, so he did not recant, and he waited for his trial, and a year later he was found guilty and sentenced to being burned at the stake. His last words were a prayer. He prayed, Lord, open the King of England's Within four years of his death, there were four translations into English at the behest of the king, and all of them used Tyndale's scholarship as their foundational material. Not that Tyndale ever would know that in his earthly life. And so, I wonder if we ever struggle with who or what is sovereign over our lives? For what cause are we willing to take some heat? For what worthy cause would we be willing to die? We, most of us will never have to know that. But I wonder what is so foundational to who we are that we would die for that. And so caught up in the rapid flow of everyday life with a million different decisions, Trying to survive today's challenges because that's enough at times. We seldom reflect on those deeper matters of who we are and whose we are and who is sovereign over us. Gerald May stated, there is a desire within each of us in the deep center of ourselves that we call the heart. We are born with it. It is never completely satisfied and it never dies. We are often unaware of it. But the desire is always awake. Pilate seemed to understand that Jesus was not a threat. He even seemed to be drawn toward Jesus and what he had to offer, intrigued with this truth that Jesus had to offer him. But he was trapped by his political interests and his desire to continue and succeed and stay in power. And so in order to hold on to his power, he had to turn his back on those inclinations he had of Jesus' innocence, on that truth that Jesus offered him. And in the end, 
he handed Jesus over to save his own skin. I wonder who or what is sovereign over your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the example of William Tyndale who rigorously labored and studied to make your word available to those in his nation and now that's available to us as well and, and how very essential that was for him to do. So we thank you for this Reign of Christ Sunday when we can reflect on what it means to be followers of Jesus, of what might be asked of us, and whether we're willing to go where he would lead us. Make us courageous. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. for a neighbor, Chris, who has had surgery and is in the rehab now, and then also for safe travels for those who travel for Thanksgiving and their daughter who will be coming in from college. Lord, in your mercy. Our prayers for the mother of uh, two of my students who is in the hospital on a ventilator with COVID. Prayers for a mother of two of our students who's in the hospital on a ventilator with COVID. Lord, in your mercy. So prayers for our nation and for healing cooperation and for the division to um, cease the bold prayer and needed one Lord in your mercy yeah. Lynn
pray for Fred Given, who is so instrumental in the art community in Grand Rapids and is fighting for his life in the hospital now. Lord, in your mercy. Bar. has lost the couple that raised their family next to her family for 60 years, and they died within a day of each other. Lord, in your mercy. for Tom's sister-in-law who has had surgery to remove a mass and we're praying it was successful. Lord, in your mercy. Mary. Um, As we go into a time of Thanksgiving, and set tables, there are chairs that will not be occupied this year. And so we remember those people. Lord, in your mercy. for um, our good friend John who is undergoing chemotherapy for pan pancreatic cancer and also a prayer of thanksgiving for Becky's daughter and family who have been fighting COVID um, but are doing okay with it and again in our own church family where we've had COVID so Lord in your mercy yeah. so God we are grateful to be able to lift these prayers before you to light candles as a tangible reminder that we carry within our hearts this burning desire to know you to experience your love and to share that with others and sometimes the way that we do that is by lifting their names before you in prayer and so we're thankful to have that opportunity today we pray for Kyle Cole, who will go in for surgery, kidney surgery on Friday, that that would go well. And we pray for Linda, his mom, as she continues to be such a key support person for him. We pray for Pat and Sally Nelson, as Sally cares for Pat, and um, Pat with uh, various smaller strokes has been reduced to really being quite immobile. So be with them in, in their life together some of the hardships that they face. Today I am struck by the beauty of the arts and I'm thankful for the artwork that Lynn provided for us and this beautiful bulletin cover that captures the beauty of our world that has now um, left us to some extent with the leaves coming down, the color that was there, and yet we enter into another season where there's a stark beauty to winter as well. And so even in the winter of our lives, we know that you are near I'm so thankful for beautiful music today in all different forms and for our musicians who have invited people into giving expression to their musical gifts, which then become a gift for all of us. For scriptures being read, for reflection on that scripture, for our children who study now um, beneath us in the dining room, who learn to love Jesus and know Jesus and to be sure to recognize that he is sovereign over their lives, even if they don't really know what that means. God, we confess that we are easily distracted, that our world places before us all kinds of gods that we can worship and sometimes that we do worship. 
And then we discover that those gods will fail us. And that that ache within us, that yearning, is to know you and to love you and to love those around us with that perfect love that Christ modeled for us. So help us to be faithful servants of your son, Jesus, even when there are times that we are asked to sacrifice for that love. Hear us now as we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying one with the other, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to thank you for your support as we uh, receive our offering, not in the ways that we once did, but through the box that is there. And we're grateful for the support of all the many ministries that make our lives so meaningful. And then we can organize from there and try to figure out uh, who unpacks what boxes and decorates in what way. We, uh, we sent out a notice that there had been someone who tested positive for COVID who was in worship last week. They found that out on Monday, so we put the word out there. And those who were directly near that person were contacted. It's simply a reminder to you that we're not done with this yet. Um, and it's why we wear the masks. And so I'll continue to suggest that you walk out by the side aisles, keeping some distance from each other and keeping your masks on. Uh, those who wish to linger a little bit can go into the fellowship hall and otherwise to head out the red doors um, to outside. So may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and grant you peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.